Well, good evening and welcome to our evening service at Libanus Church. We hope that you will enjoy your time with us this evening. But more than that, we hope that you will be blessed. We hope that you will have an encounter with Jesus Christ. We hope that we will be able to accurately show you and present to you that in Jesus, you can know forgiveness. Whatever you're going through in your life, whatever you're struggling with, we believe that Christ has the answer to transforming your life. For in him, we believe he can bring you peace. I've just got a few announcements this evening. And the first one is to just to thank Jeremy Bailey, the pastor of uh, Bethlehem Sandfields. Thank Jeremy for coming and bringing God's word to us this evening. Jeremy will be opening up the Bible and telling us what God is saying. And so I'm sure we will all be blessed by the ministry of Jeremy this evening. And then just a reminder that every Thursday we are putting out shorter evangelistic videos. They only last between three and six minutes. And so if you haven't got very long to watch, if you haven't got very much time to spare, I'm sure you can fit one of these videos in. So please do watch our Thursday Thought videos released every Thursday morning. And we hope that you will find great comfort and enjoyment in them. As we continue, should we just open in prayer? Father, we thank you for your provision in enabling us to meet virtually. We thank you that this is a gift from you. And we do pray now, Lord, that though this technology is not the same as physically being together, we pray that we would have great comfort and that we would come to know you in a deeper way, in a meaningful way, in a powerful way. Father, this Sunday evening, change lives. Amen. Well, we gather here together as the church. Some people might think that the church is closed. Well, we believe, Elibinus, that the church is not the building. Of course, the building is closed at the moment. But we believe the church are the people, the people who gather together. And we're going to sing a song that says, Oh, church, arise. And that's what I want us to remember, that we, the people of God, we are the church and we need to arise. We need to stand up firm and praise and worship our Saviour.
going to hand over now to Jeremy, who is going to come and bring us our reading for this evening. Well, thank you for inviting me to come and address you today. I'd like to take as a Bible reading Deuteronomy and chapter 33, and I'll be reading the first 12 verses. Deuteronomy chapter 33, the first verse, and I'm reading from the NIV. Shall we hear the word of God? <clears throat> this is the blessing that Moses, the man of God, pronounced on the Israelites before his death. He said, The Lord came from Sinai and dawned over them from Seir. He shone forth from Mount Paran. He came with myriads of holy ones from the south, from his mountain slopes. Surely it is you who love the people. All the holy ones are in your hand. At your feet they, bow, they all bow down, and from you receive instruction. The law that Moses gave us, the possession of the assembly of Jacob. He was king over Jeshurun, when the leaders of the people assembled, along with the tribes of Israel. Let Reuben live and not die. Let his men be few. And this he said about Judah. Hear, O Lord, the cry of Judah. Bring him to his people. With his own hands he defends his cause. O be his help against his foes. About Levi, he said, your Thummim and Urim belong to the man you favoured. You tested him at Massa. You contended with him at the waters of Meribah. He said of his father and mother, I have no regard for them. He did not recognise his brothers or acknowledge his own children, but he watched over your word and guarded your covenant. He teaches your precepts to Jacob and your law to Israel. He offers incense before you and whole burnt offerings on your altar. Bless all his skills, O Lord, and be pleased with the work of his hands. Smite the loins of those who rise up against him. Strike his foes until they rise no more. About Benjamin, he said, Let the beloved of the Lord rest secure in him, for he shields him all day long and the one the Lord loves rests between his shoulders. We thank God for the reading of his word. Well, before Jeremy comes and he opens up that passage and explains it to us, we're just going to first pray and then we're going to have another hymn. Shall we come together in prayer? Father, we do thank you for who you are. Before we even acknowledge what you've done for us, we first want to just praise you for who you are. Holy, just, without sin. The creator. We praise you that you are perfect in every way. That you are without any blemish, without any corruption, without any wrongdoing. We thank you that you are pure in its deepest meaning. Lord, we come to you and we worship you as the, the immortal God, the invisible God, the God that we can't see, the God who is all wise, all knowing, all powerful. And Father, we thank you that though you are all of those things, though you are that big, though you are that great, though you are that mighty, we can know you. We thank you for the great truth of the gospel that all who know Jesus Christ know you. We thank you that we can come to you, the Father, through Jesus Christ and only through Jesus Christ. And so this evening we are just thankful for an opportunity, for the privilege to be in your presence. Father, we want nothing more this evening than to be in the presence of the Almighty God. Lord, speak to us. If we have grown cold, 
If we're thinking, oh no, not another boring service. If our hearts are far from you. If we're distracted by anything else, bring us back to Jesus Christ. We pray that the message would be so powerful because it is from you. We pray it would captivate our hearts. We pray it would revive us. Lord, we pray that we would see a new vision of Jesus Christ. We pray that we would see who you are presented to us and it would flood our souls with light, with warmth, with joy. Father, I pray for every single person who is watching this video this evening, that they might come to know, that they may come to experience what a true relationship with Jesus Christ is like, what true union with Christ is like. Father, we are undeserving to know the Almighty God, and yet we pray this very evening, show us your face, reveal yourself to us, make yourself plain and clear to everyone watching this video. And we pray now for Jeremy that he would be blessed by you from his ministry, from the message that he has prepared. We pray that we would be lifted up. We pray that you would be exalted. And that you would be clear to us. We pray that you would have a private and personal message for every one of us watching this. We pray that every person who is watching this would have their heart warmed as we explore the great truths that are found in a great God. Amen. Well, this evening we're going to sing before Jeremy comes, a hymn that I quoted in my prayer, we're going to sing, I'm sure it's a favourite of many, Immortal, Invisible, God Only Wise. <laughs>
Well, it's good to be joining you uh, today there at Libanus. You're joining me here in Bethlehem in our chapel. And although I can't see you, I am in my mind picturing many of you as brothers and sisters there whom I know. And my prayer is that the Lord will bless us as we hear his word today. Now, there are some books in the Bible that we tend to keep away from. I think we do this because we think that they're either too complicated for us or else perhaps they're just not relevant to our lives today. Some people keep away from the whole of the Old Testament because of this. But I think if we do that, we will miss some real blessings of God's word. Remember that in Timothy we're told that all scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting and training in righteousness. And that includes Deuteronomy. It's true that sometimes we have to dig very deep in order to find those blessings, but they certainly are there. But here in Deuteronomy chapter 33, and that's where I want to take you today, in Deuteronomy 33, the whole chapter is a blessing. Moses is blessing the people of God. And if we are believers in Christ this evening, then this blessing is for us. Don't be shy in claiming all the blessings of Israel in the Old Testament for yourself. You are Israel, the people of God, and therefore the spiritual blessings that come to the people of God in the Old Testament are for us. So what do we discover when we look into Deuteronomy chapter 33? First of all, we, we discover the God. The God who blesses us is a great God. That's surely where we have to begin. The Bible directs us to the greatness of our God. And this chapter begins by telling us of the greatness of our God. In verse 2, we, we read of the majesty of God as Moses, the man of God, uh, speaks these words. He says, The Lord came from Sinai and dawned over them from Seir. He shone forth from Mount Paran. He came with myriads of holy ones from the south, from his mountain slopes. What a majestic picture of the God who met with them. He came from Sinai, from Seir, from Mount Paran. These are all mountains in the Sinai range. They are all in the area where God first revealed himself and gave the Ten Commandments to his people. Notice the words that Moses used. He came, he dawned, he shone. These are all pictures of God's majesty and God's glory. The God whom we worship is a majestic God. He came with myriads of holy ones. This surely is a reference to the angels of God. It also explains to us why in the New Testament, in several places, we have references to the law being given by angels or through the mediation of angels. It seems that when the law was given to Moses on Mount Sinai, there were myriads of angels with God who were there at that moment. And that explains why Stephen in Acts 7.53 spoke about the angels of God. And Paul, when he's talking to the Galatians in Galatians 3.19, speaks about the law coming through angels. And in Hebrews chapter 2, verse 2, the same thing. So this is a, a picture of the majesty of our God. Not only majesty, though. Our God is also a loving God. So we have a picture of God's love as well. Verse 3, surely it is you who love the people. All the holy ones are in your hand. God is a God who loves his people. Love is not just a quality, a characteristic of God that we read in the New Testament. We read in the New Testament that God is love. But that is also true in the Old Testament. There are not two gods. There are not even two revelations of God. He is the same God in the Old Testament as he is in the New. And we read here that God loves his people. In fact, we have in this whole chapter three very wonderful pictures of the love of God. The first is in verse 3 of Deuteronomy 33. All the holy ones are in your hand. Isn't that wonderful? 
to know that we are in the hand of God, in that protecting hand. As Jesus says, no one can snatch you from my hand. No one can snatch you from my Father's hand. I and the Father are one. We are safe in the loving hand of our Heavenly Father. And that's here in this chapter of blessing. The one that I particularly love is in verse 12. The one the Lord loves rests between his shoulders. Isn't that a beautiful picture? It's a picture of a child being lifted up and placed upon the shoulders of a parent. That protecting, that guiding hand, that loving hand. That's our God. We rest between his shoulders. More of that later. The third one is one that I'm sure you know very well. It comes at the end of the chapter in verse 27. The eternal God is your refuge and underneath are the everlasting arms. Not only are we in the hand of God, not only are we resting between his shoulders, we are also in his arms because underneath are the everlasting arms. That is the great love of our God. Not only is our God a majestic God, he is also a God of great love. And then there's another thing about God in these verses, these opening verses, and that is the kingship of the Lord. We're told that at your feet they all bow down, verse 3, from you, and from you receive instruction. And then verse 5, he was king over Jeshurun when the leaders of the people assembled. Jeshurun is a sort of pet name for Israel in the Old Testament. And it's a, it's a wonderful name, speaking of God's love for them. But here it speaks of kingship as well. They all bow down at his feet and receive instruction. The law has been given to them by Moses for their instruction and their possession. And the king, the Lord is king over them. And so here we, we have this sense of the sovereign God, the God who rules over his people. So we see that wonderful backdrop, isn't it, that Moses uses in order to bless the people of God. He speaks of the majesty of the Lord, the love of the Lord, and the kingship of the Lord. Now, with that wonderful backdrop, Moses begins to paint a picture of God's future blessings to his people, tribe by tribe. Now, anyone who's read Deuteronomy 33 will immediately, if you count up the number of tribes, recognise that one is missing. The tribe that is missing in all these blessings is Simeon. And it is worth pausing a little bit and asking the question, why is Simeon missing from the blessings? Well, this is not the first time that all the tribes have been blessed. They were blessed by Jacob, their father, before he died in Genesis 49. And it is by reading Genesis 49 that we see why Moses missed out Simeon in these blessings. And also why Reuben gets a very short and not a very encouraging blessing either from Moses. Let's go back to Genesis 49 and verse 2. In Genesis 49, Jacob is blessing his sons before he dies. I'd like to read to you from verse 2 to verse 6. This is Jacob speaking. Assemble and listen, sons of Jacob. Listen to your father Israel. Reuben, you are my firstborn, my might, the first sign of my strength. Excelling in honour, excelling in power, turbulent as the waters, you will no longer excel. For you went up onto your father's bed, onto my couch, and defiled it. Simeon and Levi are brothers, their swords are weapons of violence. Let me not enter their council, let me not join their assembly, for they have killed men in their anger, and hamstrung oxen as they pleased. Cursed be their anger so fierce, and their fury so cruel. I will scatter them in Jacob, and disperse them in Israel. So you see, Reuben committed a most terrible act of immorality. And Simeon and Levi were violent men who tricked and then attacked the Shechemites. You can read of that in Genesis 34. Now Reuben, Simeon and Levi were the eldest sons. 
Reuben was the firstborn, then Simeon, then Levi. Now Reuben, because he's the firstborn, when it comes to Moses blessing the tribes, Reuben still gets a blessing, but it's a very short one. Simeon gets no blessing at all. Because it says in Jacob's blessing in Genesis 49 that Simeon and Levi will be scattered in Jacob and dispersed in Israel. Now what that means is that eventually Simeon will cease to be a distinct tribe, but that the people of Simeon will be scattered amongst all the other tribes of Israel. But it also says that Levi will be scattered amongst the tribes. And here we see a wonderful thing how the curse is made a blessing because the Levites were indeed scattered amongst all the other tribes because they were priests and so they lived amongst all the other tribes. They didn't have an inheritance of their own. They had their cities within the tribes of Israel. That means that the very next son in line is Judah. Judah is the fourth son of Jacob. And he is therefore given the blessings of the firstborn. And that is because he didn't take part in Simeon, Levi and Reuben's sinfulness. That also explains to us why our Lord Jesus was not descended by, from Reuben or from Simeon or from Levi. But he was descended from Judah. Because Judah is given this right of the firstborn. And all the kings of Israel and Judah come from Judah, and also the Lord Jesus Christ, the King of Kings, is descended from Judah. So Reuben gets a very short blessing. Verse 6 of Deuteronomy 33, Let Reuben live and not die, nor his men be few. That's what the NIV says, but it can also read, Let his men be few, which is how I read it. I think it's saying, yes, Reuben, you will be blessed by God, but not greatly, not greatly. Your men will be few. But none, nonetheless, the tribe of Reuben would survive, unlike Simeon. So let's, let's plunge into these greater blessings then. And what I want to share with you next is, not only is the God who blesses us a very great God, but also we are blessed as soldiers in a spiritual warfare. We are blessed as soldiers in a spiritual warfare. When Moses gets to blessing Judah, these are the words that he uses. Hear, O Lord, the cry of Judah. Bring him to his people. With his own hands he defends his cause. Oh, be his help against his foes. Seems to refer to fighting in war, doesn't it? We know that the tribe of Judah were the first to march out at the head of the people of Israel. They were the ones who led out the people of God whenever they moved in the desert, whenever the, the pillar of fire and, and cloud moved and the people of God had to decamp and move to another place. It was Judah who led them out. That also means, of course, that Judah were the first ones to meet the enemy and to fight against the enemy. So the blessing seems to be this. It's a prayer that God may hear their call for help in blessing, in, in battle. Hear, O Lord, the cry of Judah. Hear them when they cry out to you for help in their time of need. And then it's also a prayer that they might be brought back in safety from battle. Bring him to his people. In other words, let him return home safely to his people. And finally, it's a prayer for God's help in battle, even though Judah will use his own hands to fight. With his own hands, he defends his cause. Oh, be his help against his foes. Now, what does that have to do with you and me? Well, we are also in a spiritual battle. That is quite clear from many passages in the New Testament. Ephesians chapter 6, for instance. We are to put on the full armour of God. We are to stand. We battle not against flesh and blood, but against spiritual forces of wickedness in the heavenly places. We are soldiers of the Lord. The moment you became a believer in Christ, you entered that spiritual battle. 
And you won't leave it until the time that you leave this world and go home to be with the Lord. And we must remember this. We are always engaged in spiritual warfare. The gospel keeps us safe. The gospel enables us to fight against the enemies of our souls. We do have enemies. The world is an enemy, very enticing. Uh, the, the flesh is an enemy, the indwelling sin and the tendencies that we have still to fail God. And the devil is a great enemy too. But the Lord is our strength and he will give us protection and he will help in the battle. Yes, we have to fight. We have to be engaged in this battle, in prayer and with the word of God and with all the protection of the gospel. And yet our God is there as our protection. He will take us out and bring us home again to our people. So we are blessed as soldiers in a spiritual warfare. You're not alone in your fight because the Lord is with you in it. Remember that when you face temptations, when you face trials of all kinds, God is with you. That's the blessing to Judah. And then I want to share this third thing with you. We are blessed as priests to serve our wonderful God. For this, I want you to, to look at the blessing on Levi in Deuteronomy 33 in verses 8 through to 10. Levi was a tribe that was favoured by God, chosen by him out of all the tribes of Israel to be the priests and also to look after two things called Thummim and Urim. In verse 8, your Thummim and Urim belong to the man you favoured. Now in order to understand what this Thummim and Urim was, we have to go back to Exodus and chapter 28 and verse 30. Exodus chapter 28 and verse 30. Also put the Urim and Thummim in the breastpiece so they may be over Aaron's heart whenever he enters the presence of the Lord. Thus Aaron will always bear the means of making decisions for the Israelites over his heart before the Lord. Now, no one really knows exactly what the Urim and Thummim were, but they're obviously physical objects, possibly like dice, but we can't be certain. But they were used in order to determine the decisions that the Lord was making for his people. Also, as you read through the Old Testament, they appear to be able to give the answer yes or no. So David, for instance, uses the Urim and Thummim when the high priest comes uh, to be with him. And, and they are used in order to determine the answers to prayer. But the point is that they were used by the priests. They were entrusted to the priests as part of their prayerfulness and their determining of the will of God. Then we're told about Levi, you tested him at Massa, you contended with him at the waters of Meribah. Along with all the other Israelites, the Levites were tested by God when they didn't have any water and when they needed that, that drink and when they complained against the Lord. But the great thing that's said about the tribe of Levi is that they were loyal to the Lord, even over and above their loyalty to their families. For this, we need to go back to the case of the golden calf. You remember that while Moses was receiving the Ten Commandments on Mount, the people of God were already breaking that commandment to idolatry, that second commandment. And so when Moses came down the mountain, there was a sound of, of merrymaking. And the people were entering into all sorts of sinful behaviour because of this golden calf that they had made. And at that point, we read this, Exodus 32, verse 26. Exodus 32 and verse 26. So Moses stood at the entrance of the camp and said, Whoever is for the Lord, come to me. And all the Levites rallied to him. Then he said to them, this is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says. Each man strap a sword to his side, go back and forth through the camp from one end to the other, each killing his brother and friend and neighbour. 
The Levites did as Moses commanded, and that day about 3,000 of the people died. Then Moses said, You have been set apart to the Lord today, for you were against your own sons and brothers, and he has blessed you this day. Now that is why we read in verse 9 of Deuteronomy 33, He said of his mother, his father and mother, I have no regard for them. He did not recognise his brothers or acknowledge his own children, but he watched over your word and guarded your covenant. The Levites proved their loyalty to the Lord. They were more in love with the Lord than they were even with their own family. And when it came to that choice between serving God or obeying their family or even showing their love and loyalty to their family, the Lord came first. The Levites were also teachers of the law to Israel. They weren't just offering sacrifices, they were also the teachers and they taught the law of God to the people, verse 10. And then, of course, they did offer burnt offerings to the Lord. So Moses ends his blessing to the Levites with this wonderful verse, 11. Bless all his skills, O Lord, and be pleased with the work of his hands. What a wonderful prayer that is. It's it's rather a, a, a good prayer for us to pray for one another, isn't it? Bless all his skills, O Lord, and be pleased with the work of his hands. Well, what has this got to say to us? Well, as I say, we are blessed as priests to serve our wonderful God. We are all priests of God. We are a kingdom of priests, says Peter in 1 Peter 2 verse 9. Like Levi, we have all been chosen to serve our God. And we must be loyal to our God, even choosing him when necessary above our families when it comes to a choice of loyalties. We're also to teach one another from the word of God. And of course, we must offer ourselves as living sacrifices, pleasing to God. So what a wonderful prayer that is for one another. As priests of God, we pray bless all his or her skills, O Lord, and be pleased with the work of their hands. But then I want to conclude this message by focusing on Benjamin. Verse 12, this lovely little blessing on Benjamin. About Benjamin he said, Let the beloved of the Lord rest secure in him, for he shields him all day long, and the one the Lord loves rests between his shoulders. Just as Benjamin had been specially loved by his father Jacob, remember Joseph and Benjamin were both sons of of Rachel. And just as Jacob especially loved his youngest son Benjamin, so the tribe of Benjamin is specially loved by the Lord. There's mention of a shield, and that reminds us again of battle, doesn't it? Benjamin was especially brave in war. When it came to them fighting against the Canaanites, under Deborah's uh, judgeship, is that a word, judgeship? When Deborah was the judge of, uh, uh, of, of Israel, J- Benjamin gets a special mention in dispatches as being a very brave tribe. So, so Benjamin also were engaged in this spiritual warfare and this physical warfare in the Old Testament, but they were specially loved by the Lord. And the last line is, as I say, very precious to us. The one the Lord loves rests between his shoulders. What does this mean? Well, there is a sort of double meaning here. First of all, there is that wonderful meaning that we do actually rest between the Lord's shoulders. We are being protected by him. We are resting on his shoulders and being protected between his shoulders. As a child is lifted high and placed upon the parent's shoulders for protection, uh, so the Lord lifts us up and protects us. But there is another meaning. And it comes out, if I put it like this, we rest between his shoulder blades. You see, the word can also mean blade. Shoulder blades, shoulders, blades. And blade speaks of sword. And again, it can mean that the Lord will fight for Benjamin. And both senses are true of us. The Lord loves his people so much So if you are in Christ this evening, 
You are especially loved. You are in a spiritual battle. Never forget that. But you are also priests to serve your God by offering yourself as a living sacrifice day by day to your God and teaching others the word of God and blessing others as well. That's our role. That's why God has, has called us together to be his church. It is so that we can be engaged together in this spiritual warfare to encourage one another. No soldier alone is going to survive long on the battlefield. That is why church is so important. You need your brothers and sisters so that they fight alongside you and sustain and strengthen you and pick you up when you fall. But you also have a loving God who loves you so much that he will fight for you and with you. And also within the church, we are priests together to offer up our praise and worship and honour and glory to our great God. Such is the wonderful blessing of God to his people. Shall we pray? Heavenly Father, we thank you for this passage in your word. We pray that its truths will go very deeply into our minds and our hearts. And we pray especially that you would in enable us in the spiritual warfare to be soldiers of Christ and to stand and to support one another and also to remind ourselves that we are priests offering spiritual sacrifices to God through Christ Jesus. We thank you then for your great love for us and we pray that you will continue with each of us for we ask these things in the Saviour's name. Amen.